The 15th Finance Commission's final recommendations for a period between 2021 and 2026 have already been tabled in the Indian Parliament to talk about that and a lot more. Joining us today on ET Now is the Chairman of the 15th Finance Commission, Mr. N.K. Singh, uh, speaking with us today at ET Now. Mr. Singh, appreciate you taking your time out and speaking with us today at ET Now. Let me first begin by asking you about the budget that is winning accolades uh, far and wide. India's Finance Minister promised a budget like never before. And this is really a budget that will be uh, will, will be looked at, uh, will have, in fact, has set a high benchmark in terms of its accounting standards as well. First of all, uh, now that this budget is out of the way, I want to understand from you in terms of what would be the next few crucial things that finance ministry will have to look at, given the fact that we're still in the midst of the pandemic. So I, I would say that, first of all, a very general, very brief comment uh, on the budget. I believe that this budget is a tectonic shift because it's a mindset change from the kind of the uh, hangover of uh, the issues of uh, the Fabian socialism, which had bedeviled the first few years of India's independence and the policies which we adopted. That mindset change prevented us from undertaking the kind of liberalization needed as the rest of Asia went forward, as China went forward in 74, mm. we, did not, we had to wait till 1991 for the important uh, regulatory and other changes to be put together. Thereafter, there were important changes during Mr. Vajpayee's period, particularly telecom and roads connectivity. But thereafter, I think the structural reforms again occupied the back seat. This is for the first time a recognition that if India's growth potential is to be realized, we need to get out of this old mindset, which had hobbled our growth potential. We have done fundamental things in terms of encouraging and inviting private capital, private capital in the banking sector. First time a decision to privatize two banks. It's an important decision, an important landmark decision of recognizing the limitations of an ownership which was trapped with the, with the sovereign itself. In terms of recognizing the diminishing value of large number of public sector undertakings, which oh. were in the non-strategic area. And I think from that point of view, and investing all this, oh. infrastructure, social infrastructure, and in terms of improving the overall uh, competitive efficiency of the Indian economy. It's interesting that you're calling it a mindset change. This budget has been has brought in a lot of mindset change. In fact, India has embarked a new age of privatization as well in this budget. Uh, but do you think it's a little late given the fact that we've le really seen a lot of investor wealth being destroyed, uh, you know, in, in one public sector company after the other, including uh, the banks as well, that have lost so much due to their inefficiency and, of course, private competition as well. Is it too little too late? The better late than never uh, would be my first response. We needed to do this much earlier. I agree with you. But should we not acclaim the moment that we have finally grasped the wasted time and wasted opportunities? And that it is much more problematic to undo the past than to chart a new future. In some ways, the budget does both. It tries to wrap up the legacy and it looks to a better future embedded in technology, embedded in the new possibilities that the internet revolution has brought about, right. of the adoption of 4G, 5G for agriculture, for education, for health, for a number of other activities. And therefore, I think that we have grasped these emerging opportunities hopefully just in time, because many new futures of the internet revolution are unfolding now. Right. The 5G is unfolding now, and we have grasped it in time. Right. You know, uh, while you're talking about privatization, I also want to get your comments on uh, the fiscal roadmap as well. For this year, FY21, the finance minister has said that we're going to take an expansionary, uh, uh, you know, mode. We will be uh, meeting, uh, we will, in fact, be exceeding our fiscal deficit target by 9.5%. Do you think that the government is uh, 
So what the government has done is delayed the fiscal roadmap way beyond India's comfort level. Also, I want to ask from you, you have recommended in your uh, uh, report an FRBM Act restructuring that is perhaps the need of the hour. What is it that the government needs to do, even though the government is still uh, you know, looking at uh, uh, you know, those recommendations as well? So I think a couple of very uh, quick comments. Uh, first and foremost, let me compliment the government that um, in putting the 9.5 number, it is not only a consequence of uh, shrinking uh, somewhat uh, shrunk revenue or somewhat elevated, significantly elevated expenditure, but also the outcome of much more transparent accounting. In the past, people have adversely commented the FRBM committee, which I chaired, had adversely commented on the tendency to hide the actual fiscal deficit by subterfuge methods like off-budget borrowing, uh, guarantees, contingent liabilities uh, uh, through parastatals or statal companies. So I think that the budget comes clean on that. And this is, if you ask me, a very, very welcome development. So that is the first thing. Second, I would say that I fully understand that or anybody should understand that in the current pandemic, it's best to really ensure that you move, you recognize the facts and then move on. In moving on to the future, they have perhaps suggested a, a roadmap for themselves, which is a little more elevated uh, than the roadmap which we had recommended in the Finance Commission. But I understand that there are many uncertainties still. The pandemic is still to play itself out. And I think that uh, the recovery, global recovery still remains exceedingly fragile. Our own recovery process as a result of what are the beneficial impacts on mm -hmm. India's potential growth, which these important economic reforms that usher, these are all multipliers, which or no. these are all issues we will need to watch. Also, I think that one important thing is to bring the states as an important player. We have given in the Finance Commission's report not a fixed point. We have mm. given a range both for the states and for the center. For the states who had adopted a 3% uh, deficit for themselves in their own legislations, we have recommended 4%, which mm. have been accepted. We have recommended a 0.5% additional contingent and power sector reforms, which have been yeah. accepted. And also, I think that we have used the word under normal circumstances. Normal means that anything on account of the extra borrowing due to the GST compensation says not being given to them would be over and above. Yeah. So we have given a range for the states and a trajectory for the states. Similarly, for the central government, I quite understand that they would at the moment look to a somewhat more elevated range. Your last question uh, to this was, we ha have we recommended a new FRBM roadmap? Oh. We have, we have done that. We have suggested the constitution of an intergovernmental group for the general government. Do not think, Ruchi, that the last FRBM committee, which I chaired, concentrated really on the central government. But all, clearly, investors, rating agencies, and so on, look at the general government, both in terms of debt and in terms of fiscal numbers. It is therefore, if we have called it intergovernmental, because it means the states and the central government to look at all these issues of fresh on the issue of both the what would be an appropriate fiscal trajectory considering this pandemic and considering the appending uncertainties and considering the uncertainties of the global recovery process. I also must ask you, sir, while we're talking about uh, the fiscal de deficit uh, and, and the glide path, uh, uh, for states, the commission has recommended a fiscal deficit of 3% uh, by FY26, but for the center, 4.5%. That's what the center has said for itself. Um, this, of course, means a much more stricter target that we're, we're uh, likely to see for states. Do you think it could be detrimental for the growth push that is required in the post-corona world and that, uh, and also, uh, you know, dil really diluted the entire effort towards spending as has been envisaged in the budget itself? I do not think so. I think that as far as the states are concerned, the flexibility uh, which we have given to the states in calibrating their debt and the fiscal deficit uh, targets are realistic and uh, are appropriate. And I think that they, sh they should have no difficulty, given the fact that we do expect 
a revival of the economy as a whole. We do expect the GST to look up. We do expect the benefits of the revenues to benefit the states as well. I think that would be quite appropriate as far as central government is concerned. Yes, it is true that they have uh, preferred a somewhat more, somewhat more elevated path than the path which you would have preferred. But as I said, that there are many uncertainties currently, both for the global economy, both for the pandemic as far as India is concerned, and for the revival process of our economy to take it to India's growth potential. Because if in the R minus G mm. is an important ingredient, if the G goes up significantly as a result of many of these reforms, I think that servicing these obligations should not be problematic. I have to also, also ask you about one of the recommendations and while we're talking about the center and state relationship, uh, the one on uh, 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 any sort of major increase in cesses. Once again, in this budget as well, we have seen increases coming in as far as cesses is, uh, are concerned as well. And this has really diluted the revenue sharing formula by subsequent uh, commissions. What will this really mean for the federal structure? And if the union government really continues to use cesses as a tool to raise resources for itself, then how can states manage manage the development to work. Uh, uh, talk to us about what role can the Finance Commission really play to resolve such kind of an issue? So I think that there are several issues which you have mentioned, uh, Ruchi, in your question. First and foremost, let me say that we are not the first Finance Commission to have commented on the growing incidence of cess and surcharge. Earlier Finance Commissions have equally commented that these instruments of test and surcharge should not be used as a device to shrink the divisible pool, which cannot, and because the gains from cesses and surcharges are not shareable. So we have also commented on them uh, somewhat adversely. Second, I think that this requires a constitutional review. It was outside the purview of the mandate of the Finance Commission to talk about a constitutional change in regard to cess and surcharges, because as long as the constitutional provision remains, these we know are not part of the divisible pool. Third, uh, I would say that we recognized that between the 13th and the 14th Finance Commission, the incidence of cesses has gone up to shrink the divisible pool. And that is why, as a compensating mechanism, in addition to the 41%, we had suggested, which has been accepted, a very robust revenue deficit grant of no. 2.95 lakh crores, a devolution to the third tier, significantly enhanced at over 4 lakh crores, a much larger increase for the disaster management. So I think that these grant components are no. designed to partly mitigate the incidence of the shrinking nature or the divisible pool. But yes, where I agree with you, the growing incidence of cess and surcharges require a very calibrated and very, very, uh, very, very integrated discussions and dialogue between all stakeholders that the growing incidence of this must not be done in a manner to neutralize the basic philosophy of the Finance Commission, well, large resources from the divisible. Right. Right. Let me also ask you, so while we're talking about the center-state relationships and one of the recommendations that have that has been accepted by the finance minister in this budget is that of a better healthcare infrastructure. Even as finance minister Nirmala Sitaraman has vouched to double healthcare spending, do you think we need a body or a council that could be set up to perhaps re-emphasize the continuous monitoring of healthcare spending by states as well as the center as we're coming out of the pandemic? Well, I mean, we have suggested, uh, not a body, but we have suggested uh, several uh, important changes in the health sector. Uh, we have, for instance, for the first time, uh, foreclosed 70,000 crore from our award to the third tier for using those resources for improving primary health centers for infectious diseases or laboratory testing and so on and so forth at the grassroots level, and that will make a significant difference. In addition to this, 
uh, we had proposed, and this is something which is reflected in the finance minister's speech, significantly enhanced a public outlay. Because currently, which you know, Ruchi, uh, the, it's let around 1% or so, 0.7% by the states, and 0.3%. This is grossly inadequate. We have suggested no. other, other regulatory changes, like no. suggested the constitution of an Indian medical service. Now, if you look at the uh, Services Act of 1951, the constitution of an Indian medical service is one of the services which were there in the Act of 1951. I think it's about time we look at the entire manner in which the issues of the healthcare system. And um, finance minister has mentioned about two bills, the allied workers bill, another bill in regard to the nurses. So along with additional financial outlays, which are necessary, we need to ensure that the regulatory structure governing the entire health system, both for the union and for the states are revisited. Well, absolutely. In fact, you know, I must also ask you on another uh, key issue that the panel has uh, talked about, and that is of GST. Uh, now we're seeing things kind of really stabilizing with respect to GST, but a lot needs to be achieved. What kind of recommendations has the panel made and how, uh, you know, how soon do you expect the government to walk the talk on some of these recommendations uh, under GST as well? Because this is going to be pretty critical, even though now we're seeing for the last few months, the GST collection surpassing the 1.1 uh, lakh crore mark, uh, but for we do need, of course, a, a, a more uh, stable indirect tax reform regime as well. Well, you know, we have a, a, a pretty robust chapter on resources, hmm. our finance commission's recommendations. Some of them are really ongoing uh, reforms which are taking place. Finance minister herself has pointed out the number of changes which have been introduced in terms of procedures and processes on the GST, which has had beneficial impact, better system of invoice matching, uh, preventing invoice manipulation, uh, uh, improvement in the technology platform. These are some Im important immediate steps to which the finance minister also alluded in her budget speech. Beyond this, we have suggested some other more abiding changes in the GST framework in terms of inverted duty structure, standardization of rates, moving towards a genuinely revenue neutral rate, which may not lead to an increase in the rates, but a better broadbanding to ensure that we do not have a multiplicity of rates and we are not cluttered with too many exemptions and too many discretions, which will improve the gains to all stakeholders namely the benefits to the consumer in terms of greater predictability and certainty of rates, to the state governments in terms of garnering the benefits of higher GST, and the central government in being able to realize what was expected from the gains of uh, ongoing GST with a genuinely revenue neutral rate. So there are procedural changes, mm -hmm. then there are more structural changes. And I think on the structural changes, the finance minister uh, and more particularly the the finance ministry officials have commented that they are cognizant of this and that the GST Council is cognizant of this. And we expect that the GST Council, which is the only constitutional body to look into the GST, will give okay. it the priority attention which it deserves. Oh, absolutely. In fact, this is, uh, you know, uh, on the finance minister's radar as well. I know, sir, we're running out of time and this is going to be my last and the final question. Uh, I want to get your comments on uh, the, the recent issue of farm laws as well. That have, of course, become a major uh, issue of public protest as well as debate, given the fact that the next era of reforms, uh, I mean, uh, uh, is going to be crucial. Given your experience in public policy, I want to understand from you, will the recent protests really install the reform process given the political costs that are attached to it? Let me put this way to you that we have dealt with this issue in uh, our sectoral uh, initiatives, which you had pointed out, which is likely to be subsumed in the restructuring of the uh, centrally sponsored schemes and the central outlay which was mentioned by the finance minister in her speech. But agricultural reforms, Ruchi, are far beyond this present uh, uh, business of the farm laws. They, are, um, they need a far more significant changes in terms of crop diversification, improving farm incomes, 
enhancing productivity of agriculture, economical use of water, because some of our cropping patterns are excessively water intensive, being mm -hmm. able to move over to higher content of proteins, which are necessary for our diet, to concentrate on the great untapped potential of agro exports, uh, as I mentioned about conservation of groundwater, yeah. in ensuring that we do not continue to import those items which are uh, excessively, which are uh, import intensive, but can be grown gainfully given our comparative advantage in, in this country itself. So I think that agricultural reforms as a subject and harnessing technology, which is now available, is a much wider issue necessary for India's long-term prosperity, for its agricultural economy as a whole, doubling farm incomes, making agriculture a mainstream contributor to India's economic development process. Right, all right, sir. On that note, appreciate you taking your time out and speaking with us today at ET Now. Thank you very much. Thank you.